written. I have here a few more. I just go briefly over this because the reason for, for this, we will hear a lot about uh, different activities we are doing in the ISP or uh, in, in what other activities I'm involved that you know where all of this information is coming from. As Uda said, I'm chair of the COP containment and recently uh, founded the, uh, the special interest group of robotics. I will, this will also be a little bit a part of the presentation. I'm a member of the cerebral processing group. So, as Uda mentioned, we have published a containment uh, guide or a containment manual in German language five years ago and three years back is the English version published. By the way, one of the most uh, sold uh, documents published from the ISP, we have already more than 1,100 books sold. So ATMPs, Advanced Therapeutic Medical Products, that is another ISP guideline. We're working on it. There I'm responsible for the chapter manufacturing. So we have been involved in the ISP in the PIX Annex 2A for ATMPs, but also into the new draft Annex 1, where I'm in the commenting group, and where I would also like to um, get a few words on it is on this recently published PDA uh, document preventing contamination and now uh, points to Cosinda for a septic processing of several pharmaceutical products and isolators. <clears throat> so I have posted it on my LinkedIn to my LinkedIn followers recently and this hits more than 21,000 views and comments where I uh, was really surprised of. So I'm also a member of the ISO. A TC198 about aseptic processing. So the Annex 1 is a draft, is a document where everybody globally is quite interested in this document because there is since more than 10 years the first publication, a regulatory publication of a guideline for aseptic processing. So the, fir the first draft was published in December 2017, just before Christmas on the 20th of December, to uh, everybody to comment. So they got around 6,400 comments back from the industry all over the world. It was a completely uh, new write of the document. And the Annex 1, yeah, many uh, think always it's a European document, but it is, but in the end, it's a global one because there is also PICS involved, which there are 53 member states where India is also a member, as well as the World Health Organization. So the draft uh, 12 version, which was then published on the 20th of February this year, and between were a lot of diff a few more drafts, not of them were all published, but some people had uh, the chance to have had a look on it. But all of those um, different drafts were a lot of changes made. So I have always put something on the side where, where you could really see that there is which every draft they worked internally or uh, which were published, a lot of changes to the previous draft were done. So on the, the delay, yeah, we talk now uh, two and a half years on this document, you know, we had a delay that uh, because of the Brexit, where then the EMA has to move from London to Amsterdam and the MHRA was yeah, responsible for this document, or the not responsible that, that were the, the head or the chair of this document. And they have uh, submitted the document to the EMA and the EMA have then given it back to the central European part uh, where it's now under their revision. So what uh, was learned between the 2017 to the 2020 version? So the comments were not sent out to the whole document possible to response. This was more on specific topics. And the lesson learned why I mentioned this, I have told you in my previous slide that I was also involved in the PIX Annex 2A for ATMPs, and they also send out questions to specific topics where they wanted to have the answers from the industry. And I had the luck that I met the chair of the PIX Annex 2A, and we, I have done an interview with him, which is recorded. 
and uh, also I've posted this on my LinkedIn page. Uh, and there he told me that they have wanted not to get all so many questions back from a document. They said they wanted, they have selected around eight to nine questions to the industry where they wanted to have feedback. And he told me already that for the next version, a similar will happen that they will ask the industry to only answer to certain questions and not go to all of them, all of the industry, more to the uh, stakeholders like the ISP, PDA and others. So in my presentation for today, I will not go into the details that I that I look about every wording, what is mentioned there, that I say if this wording could have been better or that this wording should be a little bit differently, because this was the last couple of months done. We have to wait on the final version that will come, maybe hopefully end of the year, beginning of next year. And then we will see what they have then chosen on wording from the uh, various stakeholders responded. But what I have seen, the comments were going back or in from the different organization, similar the same. So what are the major drivers? And this is also something what I'd like to focus on the next hour. Contamination control strategy. This is that part where the regular to, where, which you can find to the whole document. And this is that what they uh, <coughs> wanted to see in the future much more that you have a contamination control strategy, quality risk management. There's often discussion uh, keeping operators out of critical aseptic operations. I want to say keep it out, keep it in a way that they could uh, not be exposed to critical areas. And what you can also hear on various conferences the last couple of years is about barrier solutions. This is the preferred solution because the inspectors or the regulatory authorities see the barrier as the most appropriate uh, solution to protect the septic product or the sterile product. So <clears throat> what uh, different uh, types of barrier system what we have? In general, in the document, we consider barrier as wraps, restricted access barrier system, what you can see here in the middle or isolators and a conventional is more than less described that you have a great A air supply with a great B surrounding. But in a way, if you have your curtains that your operators have access to critical aseptic operations. So why do they have their uh, concerns about the different solutions? So when we look about conventional aseptic processing, there are concerns for the inspectors are that operators have all the time uncontrolled access to critical areas. They cannot control how long they stay in, in a grade A era and critical aseptic operations. This is not a real barrier. So in general, everybody has access to the critical area, to the critical points. And the only barrier where you can often see are provided from a certain curtains. But all those these curtains, you know, when you see what the operator is doing here, touch the inner side or the, the for the great air A area or the ISO 5, he touched the inner side of the curtain, yeah, which can pose potentially a risk to that side and is then exposed to the inner part of the critical zone. You need also intensive training and monitoring. Yeah? People working in a grade B environment and um, provide them also critical aseptic or sterile operations under grade A air supply. This is, they have to be, have a long training. Yeah? They have to appropriately count. And, they, and this training, yeah, when it's well performed, can take a long time, yeah? up to six months that a person is uh, suitable to do this. So, and there are dimension clearly technology should be better to replace to barrier solutions. But even in barrier solutions, we have uh, different technologies available. So wrap system, restricted access barrier system is a kind of barrier where, the, where we have also different type of wraps. So I do not go in all of the details of those access barrier system. I will explain it a little bit. 
And I will also not say which one is better or, or which one is more suitable. I will focus on the parts what is uh, critical to see when you use uh, barrier system on, or what you have to consider that you have um, successfully installed and operated a sterile processing. Wraps, we can have an active wrap, some passive wraps. And passive wraps is in general wraps where they use the air uh, from the room, yeah, and to provide those on top of the a critical a sterile processing zone. You can have an active wraps which has this integrated air handling system. You can have an open wraps. An open wraps is similar like here, where the air goes out here into the room and you take maybe the room, the air back from the room, or you have a closed uh, wraps yeah, where you recirculate the air like you do it also in an isolator. So <clears throat> as long as it's not a closed wraps, the barrier doors uh, can be open. So that means an operator has access, as you can see here. On the doors, he can open them and can have uh, access to critical aseptic operations. The background is there also grade B and you need the same intensive training and monitoring. And what the regulatory the inspectors always mention on those conferences I'm attending, and in general I'm attending many of those conferences, that they see more and more poor designed wraps on the market. So why they are, the reason for it is, you know, there's one example you will see later on also in another example in when I go through all the different areas. You know, as mentioned, they have doors. Yeah. And, the, and an optimal or the best way to have a door is like this one shown here in the picture when it's folded like this. You know, the inner part, which is exposed to the great air, air supply to ISO 5, they fold in together. Yeah? They are not really exposed to the great B area. And when you have fold this, for instance, away, and the operator touches the glass, then it glass, then it touch the glass outside of the of the wraps and not inside of the the critical zone. And this is often what I can also see as a, only a small example. Yeah, that there many companies have to swing doors where they can swing up, and then the operator have the, there's the risk that the operator touched then the inner part of the glass, and this is then afterward exposed. And the same is when the airflow is going from the inside to the outside, it should be then when you close the door in a way that this floor from inside, the airflow from inside to the outside is not disturbed. This is also the reason why you can in general uh, find more uh, FDA warning letters on the FDA website about a uh, restricted access barrier system. And it's exactly the reason why I have mentioned it. And this doesn't matter in which region that they are uh, installed. So this is a warning that they issued to a European manufacturing. And there were two aspects were criticized in, with regards to 21 Code of Federal Regulations, inadequate aseptic techniques and mechanical faults during media film. The inspector supported the inadequate aseptic techniques with a video recording of a line setup followed by the filling it showed the following incorrect behaviors. For instance, an employee handed a pen to another employee direct above the stopper ball. Stopper balls that will come later on on this they are considered as indirect product contact parts, and especially a septic or a sterile area should not be disturbed. The first air above their area should not be disturbed from someone. So an employee was sitting on the floor during line setup and did not change the gown afterwards. <coughs> Yeah, that's happened. People sit down on the floor, not all over the world, yeah, because, you know, for those who have ever worked in a grade B environment, knows how long it takes to do all this gowning, yeah, and how and we know now with all of the masks we have to wear due to COVID-19, how uncomfortable it feels when you always breathe against yourself, yeah, and you... This is not the same as you receive the same amount of air when you are breathing without any mask. Yeah? And people do this, yeah? and so they're all so lean, as the third point mentioned, against the cleaning wall, and they often do not realize it, that they do it because they are used to do it when there's a wall and when, when they think about something that they are, it's not on purpose, they lean against it, but it's, it's not something what someone would like to see that people lean against the wall.
Or the third, the fourth point was, this was I mentioned before, an employee left the door of an wraps open for a considerable time during the filling without working in the intermediate area. Such things also happen. So before I go to the isolators, I just uh, want to explain what is normally a uh, difference. So with the wraps, as long as it's not a closed wraps, operators have direct access to critical areas. This is not the case, so it's an isolator, the doors are locked. The surrounding is a grade B, so this is also what it means that the operators like this person here have to be counted in grade B. You need also much many more people, yeah, you know, you cannot work the whole eight hour shift uh, uh, dressed like this, so people have to leave the area and new people come in. So and there you have in an isolator surrounding class C or D. Depends on the region where you uh, install the isolator. So that means that the people can walk around more comfortable. The decontamination is mainly done in wraps together with the room. And in an isolator, you have unvalidated and most of the time an integrated uh, decontamination system with vaporized hydrogen peroxide. Wraps are normally not suitable for high potent product. I mentioned this because in that um, industry we are working, are more and more these high potent products coming or also more products which require higher a biosafety level. And there, uh, due to his more close barrier, uh, isolators are more suitable for high potent product. As uh, Uda mentioned, we have already given a webinar for the ISP India uh, four to five weeks back about GMP and occupational safety where I was really surprised I think we had in total uh, with the viewing of the, the recording what we have done up to 1000 people which was for sure the largest audience that I ever had for uh, giving that presentation. So then isolators there I mentioned operators have not right access to critical areas. They have a validated, normally accepted uh, uh, decontamination system. There I will go more in detail on the during the presentation. You have less uh, reduced clean room requirements. Yeah, when you also look about the green footprint in the future, yeah, you, when you large areas of grade B surrounding, you need a lot of air changes, a lot of air preparation and cooling areas. <clears throat> But they're the same, yeah, the, what the regulatory authorities say, more and more poor designed isolators on the market. And a poor designed isolator is also high risk to the product and leads the same way as reps to drug shortens when it's not performed well. Yeah, five rings, five Olympics rings. I created and designed before I started my first webinar or a, a virtual uh, seminar together with the ISB uh, India because as you know this year the uh, Olympic Games should have happened in uh, Tokyo Japan but due to COVID-19 so postponed to next year but at least that we can talk a little bit about the Olympics I put in the five rings together and these are the five topics where I wanted also to guide you through the presentation where I like to focus on that what is mentioned in draft annex one and where uh, I think that should be also, where you should have a look on it when you work in more detail on this. So you will find also those dots, if this is the yellow, the blue one or green one, also on the different slides that you always know for what uh, topic we are, uh, what topic we are talking on that slide. So automation digitalization, I will mention this because it's in the beginning of the Annex uh, one draft mentioned. Then I will go in a septic equipment design. They will spend a little bit time on it. You know, I have studied mechanical engineer. I have worked before I went into the aseptic field many years in uh, infant food design. And when you have ever delivered an equipment to a company who provides baby food, then you then you know what hygienic designs mean. Because there was many years back already always the, the focus is to say only hygienic design can lead to 
to high quality product and where we can prevent any contamination. So <clears throat> later on, uh, I started then many years on, uh, on hygienic design. Anywhere there close to where I live is the EH, the European Hygienic Engineering Design Group, where I was part of it many years. And then uh, more than 20 years back, as qualification and validation was coming up, uh, I was also involved many years how to perform validation and qualification for, let's say, pharmaceutical industry. So the yellow dot, this is also something I like to talk a little bit more, is sterility with isolators and surface decontamination. Aseptic equipment design comes and also to the fourth dot with clean to prevent contamination and cross-contamination because only aseptically designed equipment or the interior of an isolator can prevent contamination, yeah, microbiological particulate or across contamination in shared equipment and shared facilities when you also work with high potent substance. And this is then the fifth dot where I wanted to go a little bit uh, in the end because in the draft Annex 1 there is also mentioned a little bit how to deal with uh, high potent substance and I think there's also a little bit on misunderstanding what should be done there. So, when we go into the first is introduction, the, the, and in fact, is the, the principles. When we look at the principles, there's mentioned the manufacture of sterile products is subject to special requirements in order to minimize risk of microbiological particle and pyrogen contamination. The following key areas should be considered. There's the mention the use of appropriate technologies like Restricted access barrier system, that's explained a little bit already. Isolator, robotic system, rapid microbiological testing and monitoring systems should be considered to increase the protection of the product from potential external sources of particulate or microbiological contamination, such as personal. So robotics is mentioned in the new draft Annex 1. And when you go in such aseptic conferences, which also the ISP provides normally every year in Bethesda in, in the US, where the regulatory authorities and inspectors also be part of the conference, there you often hear the word robotics. The use, why do they speak about robotics? You know, with robotics, you can make operations validatable, repeatable, and reliable, yeah? That you can design the equipment, how this performs sterile uh, processing in a an, in an much controlled way. So, <clears throat> in general, it is robotics uh, not only a topic that we talk about, okay, how we can robotize, fill in vials, syringes, ampules, or whatever. So robotics can also be used for different aseptic uh, operations. So, but in, but in example, in, in this example, is that you know some of the aseptic product comes also in a powder form, filled in cans, aluminium cans, and there you have also to perform, process them in a in an aseptic environment. So. As Uda said on what was mentioned in the beginning, I have founded the ISB Special Interest Group Future Robotics end of uh, last year. The re so this is not that we talk since end of last year about robotics and aseptic processing, but many people always think, okay, we replace maybe the movement, what was done with something different now with a robot and then we are good, and this is in general not the case. Yeah, When you have robotics, then you mostly have also gloveless isolators. This also require a new uh, way of viral monitoring because you have no direct access anymore inside, so this has to be automatically done or with a rapid micro method. You need also other supports. You need also automatic transfer of stoppers, caps inside. Yeah? There is not something that you have a glove can open the RTP and the material is transferred inside. Ready to use. End to end is also a topic what we are discussing in the special interest group of the SIG Future Robotics. 
because it gets more into the ready to use uh, like nested uh, vials or syringes and they create a lot of waste. And as we want to go more and more sustainable, we want also to reduce plastics, let's say like this. So I have here an example of an installation with robotics where I wanted to show you the, the video. And this explains an, an, an process where up to 10 kilogram of sterile uh, active pharmaceutical uh, creed, uh, powders is uh, delivered in such aluminum cans and they were they go through an airlock inside of the first main chamber where a robotic open let's say a little bit complicated uh, cap and lid a cap of the can and then it transferred into the into the main chamber where the sterile powder is then discharged and before i start the video there's just one thing what i wanted to explain to you why this is uh, let's say but the devil is in the detail, let's say like this, when you talk about the septic processing. You know, when you look in the guideline or also in the draft annex one, there is mentioned that the sterile product should not get in touch uh, with a non-sterile surface. And when we look inside of the isolator, this is not a sterile surface, it's a decontaminated surface, it's, a, it's an aseptic environment. So and when you would normally take such drums inside and you would open the can, yeah, and then you would um, empty it in an open, let's say in an open way, in a funnel uh, into the next process, you will create a lot of dust. This dust would settle down everywhere in the isolator. And this, when you have to transfer a lot of such drums, it could happen that those particles settled down in, an, in, in other areas could go back into the critical sterile path and this is something which should be totally avoided and this is then uh, and this was the specific design on this solution how to avoid uh, the spreading of sterile products inside and how to avoid that for um, any reason such product cannot be coming back into the sterile area again So this is the material airlock, yeah, where then all of those um, filled aluminum cans get into the airlock. The robot takes them out. And so robots can really do very complex uh, procedures. Yeah, as it said, there is a, a cap on it, which has two holes. He has to identify the holes. He have to open this and have them to remove the lid. When this is done, then it goes in the second one where the stopper is removed. And then is a specific docking valve connected to the top of the can. The dock, the, this docking valve is used for that reason that we that no spread of the sterile powder is inside of the isolator possible. So then it's weighing done, uh, and when the, to check how much uh, how the the weight of the full drum is. So then you discharge, you dock the valve to the active valve, you transfer the material. And then you check the empty weight of the can, remove then the, the valve, put the stopper back, and then you get it out of the isolator where they then are returned to the operators, which are outside of the isolator. So <clears throat> it looks partly quite simple, but there is a lot of detailed design and a lot of knowledge uh, necessary to perform it, a GMP compliance, such an application. But what happened there with the robotic solution, what, what have been done with many operators before, with a lot of uh, manual operation is now completely automatically performed. So there is almost no intervention anymore. So that the uh, risk to contaminate the product is extremely lowered. So what else do we do? We, we mentioned uh, robotic is one part. Yeah, You have to design it that it fulfills GMP requirements. As I mentioned, this is, this is also there uh, partly very critical because it could also happen that you position uh, robotics of the, above uh, open containers where you fill sterile products and when the movement is not uh, designed 
a, um, in a in a right way that could also create turbulences when the robot is uh, moving from between the different positions. So, as I said, but the robotic is one part. There's other things what has to be con to considered. So in our special interest group of the future robotics, they will work on uh, the requirements for viable monitoring. Yeah, this has to be performed in a different way as we know it. Uh, now this is also something what the regulatory authorities would like to see more. Uh, new technology like uh, rapid micro methods implemented and also real-time release for the products that this that they have not uh, waiting a longer time until the product can be released, especially for new uh, therapies like coming from ATMPs, the real-time release more and more man, uh, needed. So, but also automation offers a higher uh, part of digitalization. Yeah, for when we talk about ATMPs, yeah, they, they also like to know all the data from the when you take the cells from the patient until the cells are given back to the patient. So go a little bit over this because there is many more slides I wanted to talk on behalf already on, on half an hour spent on the topic of robotic. So in the end, you will see then also my email address. So when those questions which cannot be answered, I will also answer them when you can when you send me an email. We have done this the same way last time. Yeah? Hygienic design, aseptic equipment design, you know, as I mentioned before, this is a part where I personally look very much in detail. When I have the view on an, on an installation, on an of equipment or of a filling line, I always look in that area how hygienically are they designed, are there some gaps or some areas where maybe cannot be appropriately cleaned or where maybe the first air is disturbed. So this is also part of the uh, Annex 1 draft, first air, refers to filtered air that has not been interrupted by items such as operators with the pot potential to add contamination to the air prior to reaching the critical zone. <clears throat> As I say, many companies are very well in designing of nicely equipment. Let's say they polish it to look even more nicely, but the polish equipment is not for me that it is uh, appropriate for aseptic or sterile processing. When I often go on exhibitions or when I'm involved in projects or when when I have when I talk uh, with companies or go to conferences, how often I see equipment design where I say there is a big a lot of disturbance for the first air with their design of the of their filling lines, for instance, or when they design the robotic instead of um, uh, such movements like here in carousels. For an aseptic design is for me like this here. Yeah? I have a clear structure where the containers are coming. There is nothing above. Yeah? Nothing disturbs the critical zone. The filling part here is also well designed where the filling comes down the same as the stoppering is performed in a way that there is not a big movement above open uh, filled walls. So this is that where I have a, a very strong focus on it. And I always say keep the most things out of critical aseptic zones and I keep it as simple as possible. The same here, this is also, this was an, a design development that was also personally involved where we have then uh, where I was asked how things should be hygienically designed. I will say here <clears throat> when I well, how often I see in aseptic processing or when equipment design aseptically operated um, lines hexagon socket screws in it. It's unbelievable yeah this, then I often say already, when I see this already, then I say, then I have not to look more in detail and I see this is wrong from the beginning, yeah, because you can screws and hexagon socket screw, you cannot really clean appropriately, yeah. Even when you clean, you push them often the dirt even more inside. And then I say, hey, look, when you would deliver such an equipment with, with only with this small 
part where I can see maybe many others there, which are even more worse. You, you when we, we would deliver such an uh, equipment to the food industry, they would never use you again because it's the worst of the worst what they can see. And this is often where I look about this to say no screws, that there is no openings. This is always throughputs and closed. Yeah, you can you can visibly see everything when you remove it. You have always gaps between that you can easily clean between the gaps. So there is not touching everything directly. Yeah, when it's not screwed and sealed totally together. So there is always a gap between, and also that you can visibly see in the area to make a in the past very complex design to a very easy designed and easy to clean operations. And this is that where I see when you make this in a, in a good way, then it's also the cleaning and the disinfection and the, dis, and the decontamination much easier to perform. And there is also the, the surface yeah, and the material what you choose in an aseptic area of really importance. Yeah? Such a surface, yeah, you can easily clean. Such a surface here, in that area, you cannot reach this area to have an appropriate uh, cleaning or a decontamination afterwards. I mentioned that uh, I was also co-author of the uh, PDA document, Point to Consider for Septic Processing of Serial Pharmaceutical Products in Isolators. This is just published a month ago. And there will always get you some uh, feedback where you can find there also something. There's also one part uh, in, in the first part of the document, what should uh, about the pressure difference between the isolators or how, how should the isolator be designed to minimize the risk post by intervention. So design is a key fi uh, figure and this is something what you should consider. So now we have spoken about robotics and uh, a septic process design. Now we come to the third dot, was the reality with isolators and H2O2 surface decontamination. So I will talk a little bit about credit air supply and surface decontamination. So what is mentioned there? As mentioned, I go not in detail on this and I will also not go in detail what was written because we have what is currently written, we have to wait until the final version is published. But there are some parts which were not for comment and those who have been in the last uh, drafts already pointed out, I think they will also remain into the final document. So there is uh, mentioned that an effective risk management system is integrated into all areas of product life cycle with the aim to minimize microbial contamination and to ensure the quality of sterile product manufacturing. It comes there again, restricted. And this sentence is one quite of interest. Yeah? And there you have to really listen carefully what is mentioned there. So restricting access barrier system and isolators are beneficial in assuring the required conditions and minimize the microbiological contamination associated with direct human intervention in the critical zone. The use should be considered in the contamination control strategy. You should consider this using wraps or isolators. Any alternative approach to be used of wraps or isolators should be justified. There you can clear see that they mention conventional, conventional lines without protection between the operator and the critical zone, they would not like to see any more after this publication. So there is then also mentioned the maintenance of unidirectional airflow should be demonstrated and qualified across the whole of the Great A air zone. So this is also, have also a small video there that you can see this a little bit. What does it mean? Make a little larger. Here you can see with a smoke generator, yeah, and there you can see also how to test uh, the unidirectional airflow. This is, for instance, for an isolator for gene and cell therapy, where there's an incubator uh, attached to the side, and there you have also in the in the area where you transfer then uh, the flask into the incubator that there is this unidirectional airflow performed. Then it's also mentioned in the uh, in the document rapid uh, transfer system of isolators. This is also like 
uh, rapid transfer systems, what you use or need to get maybe material in inside of an aseptic uh, surrounding. So what is else mentioned there? There is a lot of discussion about uh, homogeneous airspeed in range between 0.36 to 0.54 meters per second. As guidance value at the working position. So working position is there new. Before it was always mentioned 300 millimeters uh, below <coughs> the filter. And now it should be in the working position. And this is something where we try, hopefully we get this out of the next version because in the previous version it was out, now it was in again. So there might be a chance that this is not coming again with the range of speed, more that you really provide with the unidirectional airflow in the working position, regardless, let's say of the exact speed that you prevent the contamination. So normally, how is it uh, performed? Yeah, you get conditioned air to a HEPA filter, then you have the terminal filter, HEPA filter here. Depends on the isolator size, you have the diffuser membrane, the unidirectional airflow, and then the air recirculation. There you can see is in the section of an isolator. Here you have the critical zone, classified, classified working zone. Here is the diffuser membrane, there is the terminal HEPA filter, there's the fan, there's a double window here for recirculation the air and getting it back into the critical zone. So <clears throat> there is uh, also mentioned in chapter four, and this is something where I come a little bit more, get back also in the end of my presentation. So the recommendation regarding air supply and pressure may need to be modified where it is necessary to contain certain materials like patagonic, highly positively or uh, highly toxic or radioactive products or live virals or bacterial materials. The modification may include positive or negatively pressurized airlocks that prevent the hazardous material from contaminating surrounding areas. In general, I have mentioned before, an airlock is normally a closed system where you have uh, interlocked doors. There is mentioned you can have positively negatively uh, pressurized um, a system. In general, when we do trainings or when we write on guidelines, we always say GMP is uh, mandatory, yeah, when you have to perform a septic process, uh, we always put the isolator in positive pressure. To make this work for highly hazardous or toxic or whatever substances you use, we have other technical uh, measurements in use to make this safe for the operator working in this area. So I will come to this a little bit later <clears throat> on it. So for wraps, was also mentioned that you used in a septic process in the background environment and should be met at least grade B. And the background environment for open isolator should meet grade C or D, but it's the same in general for closed isolator on a risk assessment. Airflow studies should perform to demonstrate the absence of air increase during interventions such as door opening. So this is also something what uh, we have um, suggested because there is often a mix up. Uh, you have an isolator, you have not uh, such as door openings. In an isolator, a door opening is not possible. Yeah? It's possible with some wraps. But there is still, you know, this is coming back to this intervention through open doors and door design is extremely important in wraps beside other hygienic design of the interior of the area. But there I often see the most of the failures are done. And this is then often where the inspectors say, yeah, with wraps, you open it and you have the big doors, then you close the door. You have then maybe potential contamination during the intervention on the inner side of the door and so on. So this design has to be done appropriately. So <clears throat> decontamination. For wraps and isolators, the decontamination method should be validated and controlled within defined cycle parameters. For isolators, the decontamination process should be automated and should include a spurial agent in a suitable form like gaseous, aerosized, or vaporized form. So there is not all the time hydrogen peroxide mentioned, but in one uh, section of the document, there is it mentioned. What is there here? 
quite important often on the wording. You know, I know that many people or many or stakeholders, as they were also involved in the ISP, are very uh, looking very much in detail about the wording. And why is this? You know, there's something especially mentioned for those who are studied uh, qualification and validation and have worked in a GMP environment a long period of time, they normally understand the wording. But this is often not so easy to translate uh, such a wording to a machine supplier yeah, who would provide a filling line or, a, or an isolator. There is exactly mentioned when you look here and validated and controlled within defined cycle parameters yeah okay we develop a decontamination cycle that's i will uh, explain you in the next few slides but <clears throat> and then but only to say to develop a cycle where you then it, it, uh, where you make a mapping inside about where humidity and temperatures hot and cold zones and then uh, you adjust this put some uh, microbiological biological indicators on it to to validate the system and then you defined how long the holding time is of the hydrogen peroxide for the decontamination phase is in my is on based on gmp a good approach but in the end is it you have to perform it in a way that you say in which parameters does this perform all the time yeah and this means you have to go into the quality by design principles and that you have to define the acceptance areas of, for instance, temperature in which your system works always appropriately. Yeah? And not only say, are you qualified with uh, biological indicators alone? So, but to this, I will come a little bit later because there are see with many companies who provide such type of sol uh, solutions, a lot of failures. Yeah? Here is this uh, again. There is, uh, for instance, this vibration plate here for hydrogen peroxide. There we have the recirculation fan, we have the uh, terminal HEPA filter, we have the diffuser membrane. Here's the unidirectional airflow, is an RTP. Oops, there is the critical classified working zone, so the double door air return into the plenum and then back. So there's a service to different pressure indicators. So, and this is, there's uh, several uh, technologies on the market. Most common used are um, flash vaporation, how this internal work, you have a heating plate, a vaporizer plate, yeah, where you drop the hydrogen peroxide. You need flash vaporation for a, with a high temperature because the boiling point of water and hydrogen peroxide is differently and you should vaporize this in the same time, not to get a higher saturation of water first inside of the isolator which would uh, generate a less effective of hydrogen peroxide yeah and this is and this is also a reason why uh, integrated hydrogen peroxide uh, system as mentioned in the guideline yeah is have posed a lower risk on this as externally used one and here you have normally the hydrogen uh, peroxide uh, bottle normally 35 percent concentration peristaltic pump weighing system and you pump the droplets then on the heating plate so and then with recirculation you get then the vaporized hydrogen peroxide inside of the critical zone and then you recirculate it after your holding time until you have proven that uh, you have reached a six lock reduction so here it's a little bit shown more as a principle again so what you normally do, this is also mentioned in the, in the guideline, you make a leak test first, then you make preconditioning, means you get the isolated internal to temperature and humidity, and then you start uh, conditioning. That means with conditioning, you start vaporizing the hydrogen peroxide until you reach the, the, the required concentration on hydrogen peroxide in the main chamber. Then you have the decontamination time, and then after that one, you have the aeration time where you get them back to one ppm of hydrogen peroxide or a 0 0.5 or whatever is required. So when you have a good uh, cycle, then it's uh, for a large isolator, let's say between two to four hours. This is something what you should normally look at when somebody tells you about decontamination cycle times. So we have mentioned in the beginning, so there is new uh, therapies coming to the market, which also require a much faster uh, decontamination. And when you look back, maybe 
many years back where the decontamination time took partly up to 10 hours or even more. And now the industry is uh, getting more into the area where you decontaminate in minutes. Yeah. And how can you uh, speed up those? Yeah, it also depends on the size which you, on the size of a chamber which you like to decontaminate. It's also an advantage the smaller the space is. For instance, when we talk about a small footprint for maybe robotics or when we talk for ATMPs where you have smaller sections to operate, but also for large uh, filling line isolators, you can in the meantime make, make extremely fast uh, decontamination cycles. And how is this then performed? And why is this then faster? Yeah, it's an other type of a system. Instead of uh, vaporize the hydrogen peroxide, you nebulize it. So you spray it directly into the main chamber. So this goes in general much faster. Yeah, You spray it and there is um, quite important the uh, particle size and the speed. The particle size in that one reason, because the smaller the particle is, then they then the faster they get to the optimization uh, uh, phase, yeah, that they are uh, vaporized, and the faster the vaporize, the faster they get the film on the surface to perform the decontamination. And with this fast uh, reach to the surface, also a fast decontamination happen, and this goes so fast that you have this often already done within minutes, yeah. And with that uh, technology, you can also perform much faster decontamination as it is in general possible with uh, vaporized hydrogen peroxide. Here you can see this a little bit. Here do you, the thing you have to say, do the leak test, yeah, but preconditioning is a little bit differently because there is the temperature and humidity not so critical as there are with a vaporized hydrogen peroxide. During the conditioning phase, you normally reach already the, the six lock reduction, then you have only a short holding time, a safety margin, and then you start immediately the aeration afterwards. You put also less hydrogen peroxide inset. That means also that you have also uh, you have also a shortened aeration time. So coming back to that, what I always say, what is GMP? You have to define not only and say which which temperature and humidity it is. You have also to find the acceptance range of those where your system is validatable and reproducible uh, working on the same conditions. And this is, I think, this makes the difference on GMP. And when you say you make a surface decontamination as you are, as a company is more used to use it, in, for instance, in hospitals. So you, you uh, prove it with biological indicators. Yeah, In general, you have their defined test organisms, Gia bacillus tomophilus. You have a carrier's population to 10 to a sixth, carrier material is still a steel tieback, and you use as inactivation methods the gaseous hydrogen peroxide. Sure, you position those uh, indicators on worst case position within the septic or the critical area. And there you have, but you have also to look in the design yeah, that this, where, which is installed inside of the critical areas, is also possible to surface decontaminate. Sterility test is also something uh, mentioned in the draft Annex 1. I do not go there much in detail on it based on, on the time. The only reason why I wanted to mention sterility test, you know, I'm, as Uda said, uh, the company I'm working is based in Switzerland. I'm raised in, in Germany. And I have also a mother, yeah, which has, which turning soon 90, yeah, and she has Parkinson and she needs also, yeah, a lot of medication. And what I face, yeah, and drug shortens all the time, yeah, that I always have to check that I get the medicine, that I always have to check that this is there because when she does not get her medicine, she could not even walk. Yeah, she could, she could not even stand up. Yeah, she could maybe not even eat. So she can perform, let's say, an almost uh, good uh, uh, for her, for the circumstances and the age uh, a good life. Yeah, and in the end, you know, sterility test is your batch release, and the quality of sterility test should be in general the same as the as the performance in your isolators or in the system what you use and also the training and practice inside of the sterility testing because this is your batch release. 
So here again, you will find a lot of information on the PDA document point to consider about cleaning, disinfection and decontamination. Another point I want to address, this is also something what was uh, asked about uh, gloves. So and it's not a fully automated gloveless isolator used with robotics. We have uh, from a few gloves to many gloves on an, uh, wraps or on isolators. And there is mentioned the material used for glove system for both wraps and isolators as well as other parts of an isolator should be demonstrated to have good excuse me, mechanical and chemical resistance, integrity test of the barrier system, link leak testing of the glove system, the isolator should be performed using a methodology demonstrating the suitable for the task and criticality. The test should be performed at a defined period at minimum at the beginning and the end of the batch and should include a visual inspection followed any intervention that may affect the integrity of the system. There is also something on the wording where we were the same here. We said you have to, you have to, as mentioned before, you have to divide it between wraps and isolator because uh, on wraps and a glove is, is different to treat than with an isolator. And with an isolator, you make the leak test in the beginning and not in the end. With gloves, it's mentioned there, you should make it in the beginning of the end. So you should use visual inspection, but also physical technology. Visual inspection, this is quite important to know that we will also have an, a document coming up in the next couple of months uh, from an expert team where uh, what um, a risk you should consider or the prevention of risk that it comes to a pinhole in an in a gloves, yeah, prevention to do this and also about visible tests. In general, visible tests can only be performed for people who are trained for it, yeah. You have to be trained, you have 100% visibility, yeah, that means also, as you, as you can see, I wear glasses, yeah. When your glasses are not frequently adjusted, yeah, to the to your 100% uh, that you can see everything clear and in detail, then this poses a risk. Yeah? Even on glove testing, it's quite important that you that the people who perform the visible visual test that you can even find small pinholes. Then you have the visible test. Yeah, this is more many done as a drop a pressure drop test for isolators. And then in this document, what you will also find is also the information there. Yeah, what should you do to avoid that you get um, pinholes in the, or the scratches on a glove? I know this is something, you know, inspectors or the regulatory authorities put information in a guideline because of practices they see on the industry. Should we say there is a reps, there's isolated, there's gloves, or we talk about um, um, other areas where they are mentioned in the room. This is not that they do not like to have gloves. Yeah, they know that intervention is possible. They know that the reps or an isolator is much better as a conventional line, but they see um, the fears with the glove that they could have a leakage or they could have uh, pinholes or scratches on it. Yeah, but in the end, you know, when you perform your your risk management and your operator training in a way that it does not come to a risk of uh, pinholes and gloves because you have no sharp edges inside. Yeah, You do not expose your glove uh, all the time uh, to the sun yeah? and so on on, on different air on different precautions you have to consider. Then is a glove not a risk? Yeah? And then in general, your glove test will also perform a green light yeah, that you can use the glove as long as the, the expiring date of the glove is then forcing you to change the glove. But also in this PDA document point for the consider is also is mentioned what method should be used for integrity testing of isolators and gloves. Clean and process uh, is also something what I'm very experienced in this, as mentioned beginning, deals since many, many years on containment, yeah, with high potent substances, developed a containment pyramid, published this uh, ISP containment guide, and in containment is cleaning also extremely, is cleaning also extremely important, because when you cannot appropriately clean, then you cannot use your equipment 
for different products. There is also mentioned in the guideline, the Annex 1 draft, the cleaning process should be validated. This is quite interesting, yeah? Validation of, uh, of a cleaning process. They are coming back to the hygienic design. When you look often about very complex equipment used, yeah? I must say, when I look at this, and there, when I talk with inspectors, I see the same such such equipment cannot be validated cleaned. Yeah, there are so many components there, there are so many pipings and so on. You can never demonstrate that with a manual cleaning this can be validated. Yeah. So <clears throat> this uh, comes back to the hygienic design, what I have mentioned before, but there is also mentioned here, direct and indirect uh, contact parts should be sterilized, direct contact parts are those that the product passes through, such as filling needles or pumps, indirect product contact parts are equipment parts that comes in into contact with sterilized critical items and components. This is a big discussion since the first publication, yeah, how to deal with such indirect product contact parts. You know, then there's the same. When you talk with the inspectors, why did they put this there and why they so strongly focus on this? The reason for that is, you know, you have an, a surface which could be contaminated in the surrounding you use it. And mainly of inappropriate behavior of operators installing those, which can have a biofilm on it after installation and can pose a risk. In general, the operator, the, the inspectors does not say this is not a good solution. They say, as it is currently done, it poses a risk. And, the, and then you, we have to find solutions how we reduce this risk. Yeah? Or how we define parameters or, a, or, a, or a engineering control to avoid this. Yeah? In general, when I look about a stopper ball, yeah? just on one example of many, how to how you should look at it. People touch the inner part of a stopper ball for what reason? Because this is the only part where you can touch it. When you like to avoid that people touch the inner part of a stopper ball, you have to put handles around where people can then, can then touch them without posing a risk. You know, and this is that what they expect from you. They expect engineering control to avoid contamination. And this engineering control is a tool which you can do and which you can use to avoid this. Yeah? And this is something what you can also find in this PDA paper. This was the part I was responsible for. We have put four scenarios in it, how you can um, use your stopper ball in a different way. If it is a smaller one where you can autoclave on how you get it in a safe way inside, but in the same way when you have a stopper ball which you cannot remove, yeah, how you could perform um, sterility without, without removing the stopper ball. Yeah? Because it's always a risk. Yeah? When the risk removing something is higher, embedded back, then the risk leave it there then it's better leaving it there and have engineering controls out on it to avoid that there is a contamination possible. So this was as, as also mentioned in the Annex 1 about high potent products. I have to look about a little bit, okay, uh, what the time it is. Cleaning and operator safety. Yeah? When, Okay, cleaning and operator safety. So cleaning for uh, preventing gross contamination, especially when you deal with high potent substance. So there, as mentioned, I developed many years back this containment pyramid where I'm in the, must say in the meantime, really proud that this is all of the world uh, using different companies in a similar or in a different way this containment pyramid, but when it comes in aseptic processing with high potent product, where we face more and more of those, there was then also the question in the last many last year, many years back, how should we clean all of those uh, surfaces? It's not clear defined. Yeah? And four years back, almost five years back, I founded also an expert group of um, uh, 
industrial hygienists, of GMP cleaning expert, of toxicologists. Uh, we had also a GMP inspector involved. And I said, what should we define a cleaning limit based on the toxicity on the permitted daily exposure for this product for cleaning of non uh, or a in uh, non-direct product contact surfaces. Yeah. How should they be cleaned? As visible clean is not the only uh, acceptance criteria for high potent substances. Yeah, we also published this paper a couple of years back where we say limits of for surfaces non-direct product contact inside the isolators for GMP and occupational safety, virus of occupational safety, for changing format parts, you have to open the isolator, the operators have to have access to critical areas, but also limit for public surface with uncontrolled possibility of unprotected hand contact or operator safety. You will see here when you that the, 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 the values are lower than for inside of the isolators, why they are lower, quite important, yeah, because it's uncontrolled possibility of unprotected hand contact. And when there is someone interested, I can send you this, the, several, those papers. Uh, this one where these uh, occupational uh, limits are mentioned for cleaning of non-direct uh, product contact parts. So there is mentioned and also limit of airborne inside of the isolator after cleaning to protect a changeover. So it's also a question often from the regulatory, ah, but you have a filters that can be contaminated. And they say you, that you, what the, the limit uh, should be when you have cleaned your isolator and what limits of the, of the concentration of particles inside is accepted before you get the next product into the into the filling line, for instance. So this is a part of the paper, and, there, and where is it coming from? There is mention, when you look in the chapter 5.21 of part on, one of its GMP guidelines, depending on the contamination risk verification of cleaning of non-product contact surface in monitoring of air within the manufacturing area in order to demonstrate effectiveness of control measures against airborne contamination or contamination by mechanical transfer is exactly that what we have in many areas of the aseptic processing. We published the same for uh, the topic of lyophilization, how they should be cleaned inside of a layer uh, that uh, cross contamination is put to a, a limit of control. Yeah, and this is already almost my last slide. Where, I, where you can see the ISB dark containment manual. What I mentioned before, which was published in German language and English language, more than, I think, more than 1,100 of books sold globally. And how important this uh, document is already seen in the meantime from the regulatory authorities. This is also found in the library of the EDQM. And the EDQM is the editor of the pharmaceutical, of the pharmacopoeia in Europe and issues also certificates of conformance. So here is my email address in the end for those who are interested to send me later on some emails. Last time I got many emails, so I have to apologize when it takes a little bit when I, until I have answered them. But in general, I try to answer all of them which I receive. So thanks for listening now. Almost one hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for an excellent presentation going into details of contamination control strategy as the changes which are going to come in Annex 1. I'm sure everybody has really enjoyed this presentation and there were more than 250 people who are listening to this, your live presentation. There are several questions, so let's see how many of this we can take, but let me tell the delegates that uh, Richard has given his email ID uh, in this last slide. So please note down the email ID. And if you're not able to address your question, please write to him and he'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. So let's go to some of the questions, Richard. I hope we'll take a few another, for another five, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I think they're, they're, they write the questions to you, isn't it? A, yeah, yeah. so I, I will take it now. I, I have got it here on my questions tab. So let's look at this one. Uh, can, you know, uh, our category four to six products, you know, the last slide what you showed, mm. are allowed to handle in shared facility? Okay. And if yes, what are the expectations? In general, 
this is yeah it is when we have uh, between four category four and six this is also the uh, let's say there was in 2014 a DMA published a document guideline as setting health exposure limits in shared facilities this was published in 2014 after a long discussion also uh, coming up from the from the ISP many years back already in 2017 where we worked on a document called risk map and risk map we we started already that you need to have for all of your product this uh, acceptable daily exposures. Yeah, this were coming from the risk map baseline guide. And then the EMA published in 2014 and replaced two of their chapters, 3.6 and 5.18, about certain product can be produced in shared facilities that you have for all of your products produced in the European Union and are imported in, into Europe, you have to have a permitted daily exposure. And based on this permitted daily exposure, you perform your cleaning in the future. Yeah, not longer on the 10 ppm or the 1,000th of the lowest daily dose. The PDE is the acceptance criteria for cleaning in the future. So now you could say it's only for Europe, but in 2018, the PICS adopted this document as a guidance document. So all PICS member states, in total 53, the inspector used this document as a guidance document and there is a clear define that you can use when you have appropriate technologies in use. Up every kind of product exceptions is highly sensitizing material like better lactams. They are not, this is still in a shared, in a separated, dedicated uh, facilities. But others, as you mentioned, from four to six, you can use, but and there you can see also the sim similar colors here. You have to perform cleaning limits. So you have to show and demonstrate that the cleaning, what you perform are in the right levels and that you have engineering control in use and that you have your PDE calculated, but also in an early stage. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. The next one is uh, for a lyophilized product. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the acceptance criteria to be used during cleaning validation for a lyo chamber yeah so for those person i don't know if it's the same one there's two points you know when you are interested as uda said in the beginning every webinar is recorded and i was also i think it was five or six weeks back i did one and and, uh, and a gmp and uh, occupational safety there I spoke more, more, much more in detail about this, but nevertheless, it doesn't matter. We have done the same. This is this uh, paper in the PDA journal. What cleaning limit should be inside of a lyophilizer? And a lyophilizer, as you know, is a lot always a discussion. Is this a non-direct product contact part, indirect product contact part, or a product contact part? In general. We have mentioned that this is in a layer more indirect border contact part because you have not a unit actual airflow, more on turbulent airflow inside. So even the air could uh, be in, uh, in touch with one of a surface inside and could can get into the, in the not closed vial. And when you make a controlled nucleation in a layer, then they even consider it as a broader contact a surface. So broader contact surface, there is the requirements already uh, uh, on the market, how you perform the cleaning, but also in the PDE. And for the indirect broader contact parts, we have also mentioned limits here, what you should uh, consider. Because with all of the process happening in the lyophilizer, you always have a particle movement. Yeah. So when, uh, when you freeze them, when you, uh, get in a vacuum, you get particles out to the environment and when your uh, uh, life relation process is not performed well, let's say it like this, you get even more particles out. And when you start then in the end yeah, to, to, to heat this up or then when, we, when, you, when you release the under pressure, then of particles settled somewhere in the lyo can then also get back into the product. Yeah? And, they, and those particles can be in before of let's say maybe not sterile surfaces and that's the reason why normally um, isolator inner parts we have to mention then as uh, where is it mentioned for non-product and indirect product contact parts yeah. 
But for okay. those who are interested, these two, pay, these two uh, one I can share. The other one for points to consider, this is not possible to share. You have to get this from the uh, PDA yes. website. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that's right. Thank you, thank you, Richard. Now, uh, the next one, uh, when a uh, next one is referring to RAPS for assistive processing, uh, what is preferred? I think you have dealt, dwelt on it, but you can just uh, again go through this. Uh, is it a closed RAPS or an open RAPS? And how does one decide between the two? Yeah. In general, um, let me go where was it here. <clears throat> a wraps in general is has an is a closed wraps. A closed wrap a little bit better than an open wraps, you know, because in the closed wraps you have in general the same um, Restriction as you have an isolate, you cannot open the doors during the aseptic processing inside of the closed traps. So you have only access to critical operations inside of the uh, of the wraps to gloves. And when you have an open wraps, then you can always open the doors. Yeah, interventions are anytime possible. And I've recently discussed with someone, yeah. And now this is always the, the concerns of the regulatory inspectors. You open your door to a longer period of time. Your operator can contaminate the inner part of the door during these operations. And I say, you know, this is, as I said, regulatory inspectors or authorities looks more to the advanced solution, but they are completely aware that other technologies are also on the market. Yeah? This is not that they say you cannot use unwraps. But when you use unwraps, you have to make maybe some engineering control to avoid this. You could also say you use an open wraps and protect this open wraps, wraps with maybe locked doors. Yeah, you can open it, but not everybody can open it, and also not at any time. Yeah, but you could say, okay, now we have a planned intervention. I know that someone is allowed to enter the inside of the wraps, but now he gets access. You know. And this is often why it comes over to higher requirements. You always get to higher requirements because people face that some design is not appropriate for that operations. And then they then they say, yeah, get better go to an isolator, yeah, or get better go with an isolator and with an robotic system inside because then we have no human interventions sure it goes more and more in this trend that we go into the into more automation system because it is advantage but we know that there is many open wraps out there we know there is many uh, conventional lines out there but take this what what a, a inspector tells you as a chance, yeah. When you say he does not like that people leave the door open for unconsiderable time, then change this, yeah. Make a lock even on a, on an open wraps and say only my special trained person in that room is allowed to open the door. This is then recorded and documented. He opens the door. He makes the this intervention takes maybe not longer than five minutes or then he knows the door is open he performs the intervention he closed the door and the inspector would be happy thank you thank you great uh, you spoke about robotics you know use of robotics so can you yeah. elaborate a little bit more you know in when you're especially using ro robotics what is the viable monitoring tra recent trends you, you know is there is improvement so, and how yeah yeah, in general, we want to go in, let's say, in such rapid micro method technology, which is right now, let's say, in the more than the beginning of um, um, of the development and validation for aseptic processing. So so far, I have not seen a fully automatic robotic line which only use a rapid micro method. Majority is using, as I have not seen any validated one, because the regulatory does not accept a new technology where it's not an approval taken that it's better, that it performs the same or even better. 
So there is companies out there who are using robotics with only that type of method. I have not seen that they got any approval so far. The other companies make it more or less in parallel. Yeah? They have a way that they say they still get the saddle plates for the active viable monitoring inside of the isolator. And the robotic has a tool where they can position, for instance, the saddle plates on the on the on the defined uh, position for the viable monitoring, remove the lid and then starting operation, put the lid and after a certain time again, remove it always and put it back and replace then after a qualified time then the, the settle plates. But in the long time, the long term view, we would like to get um, to, to demonstrate that both uh, is working uh, the same reliable and what is the critical part in the future is to um, perform the acceptance criteria yeah? when there is something on such a rapid macro method when there is a positive coming even when it's a false positive as maybe this is coming from a particle which have also provided some um, fluent slide and uh, have put an uh, indication on it let's say what is then the acceptance criteria how many of those um, containers have to be removed have to be given to an other test like to a sterility test that, that demonstrate that this there was nothing found it's have to be developed in the next couple of um, months or a year but this is something on our top priority of the special interest group uh, future robotics where we will work on this because as mentioned in the in the guideline here uh, the use of appropriate technologies like a robotic system rapid microbiological testing and monitoring should be uh, considered to increase the production of the uh, from potential uh, contamination. So this is mentioned there. And when you go, or when you ever been to the ISP septic conference in the US, when the regulatory inspectors are talking there, robotics is often what they mention. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. So I think there are several questions, but uh, we are coming to the end of our time. So we'll take the last two questions uh, in the remaining three to four minutes. Uh, this is question about glove integrity test. Uh, what mm -hmm. should be the acceptance criteria and which guideline uh, should be referred to? Yeah. Uh, the acceptance criteria, this is maybe a little bit uh, easier to explain. And there you can also present me an email ago and afterwards back to my email address. I think in 2003, one of my colleagues They, and with other experts, they published a paper on critical pinhole sizes in, in, in isolated glove and, uh, and what critical pinhole size pose a risk uh, to the septic process inside of isolator. And um, this document uh, describes on what, um, what uh, pinhole size it goes critical that there could be some penetration from outside to inside there you can uh, very clearly read it yeah what uh, bio load was positioned outside of the glove how big the hole was and, and and how small it should be that there is not or that there is in general a minimum risk of, of uh, exposure from outside to inside so the on this document is used as guidance document is published from the pda but done from uh, uh, colleagues of mine which I mentioned on the paper, and this is used globally. Every company who provides such visible uh, glove test units use this document to validate the pinhole size on the physical tests. This is, everybody used this. This was a great work done from, from really from all of, from the scientists in, in the company working in, in that field, how to prevent contamination. Thank you, thank you. So the last question what we'll take uh, before we close the webinar is uh, about aluminum particles. Is there yeah. a risk of aluminum particles during robotic handling of cans? Uh, yeah, okay, okay. In general, you know, okay, I have not the time to run the video completely again. Uh, but for those who can remember this, you know, aluminum, 
In general, you have only the, the critical parts of the aluminum is the cap on top. I unfortunately, I have not really here. There's a cap here on top. Maybe you have seen there were two holes on it, where the crimper took it and removed a part of the lid uh, and then the second one. And that's what you have seen. This was in the first isolator chamber. So it's a really excellent question where you asked this. So and this is the reason why both isolator chambers are completely separated with an interlock door. So they are normally the most particles are generated. When you remove this, you remove, you open this and there are particles generated. But there is still the stopper below. Yeah? So it's nothing falls inside of the product. But you have to do it in a way that you create as less particles possible. This, when you have seen this, this is why the robot then push this away on the side to avoid that the particles falling on top of the stopper. And then, then when it enters to the next room, the tool who removes the stopper is also the design that with removing those, not that the particles can fall inside of the aseptic part. But this is really an excellent one. And this is why I mentioned it before I started the movie. There is so much uh, things to consider when you work with uh, uh, robotics. But Consider this would have been done manually operated. Yeah, the risk that something goes into the product, I would say, is hundred times higher as it was uh, done with the robotic because there you can every procedure is is completely validated, repeatable all the time. So now we have I have to stop now because we have now exceeded already one minute. <laughs> that's okay. Well, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I like so, it. I must really say I like it. And this is why I like normally conferences uh, face to face more because I like them afterwards, the many discussion in the breaks. And I know with yes. a virtual one, is it always limited. But I yes. put my last slide back that you can see my email address. And as I mentioned to you, some of the papers also that on pinholes and gloves mm -hmm. I can share with you and others for cleaning and cross contamination. Mm -hmm. So Richard, thank you so much uh, for supporting ISP India. Your today's presentation was really excellent, going into so many details of Annex 1 and contamination control. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm sure we will meet in future. You're planning to come in second week of January of next year. Hope by that time everything is normal and you are able to visit India so that we can meet face to face. Hopefully. Yeah, if I would not really in like January, we'll, we'll definitely look for that. So thank you so much.